Hello and welcome to the Skeptic Track at DragonCon 2023. Yay! <laughs> I know it was only Sunday, but I'm sure some of us felt like we woke up in a bathtub of ice this morning, right? So uh, Ben Radford has written thir whoa, 13 books and is an expert in folklore. So uh, he has some very interesting insight for us on urban legends. Please welcome Ben Radford. Thank you, thank you, um, and uh, thank you for Angie for that introduction, and also the tech crew. I want to give a shout out to the tech crew. They saved my ass. They, they are the real heroes here. Um, they're the real heroes here. I, I had two laptops uh, take a crap on me, and, and then here we are. Um, so yeah, so for those who don't know who I am, uh, I'm uh, Ben Radford. Um, I, I'm a folklorist, a researcher, um, and the deputy editor for Skeptical Inquirer Science Magazine. I'm a member of the American Folklore Society, uh, and I also have a master's degree in public health, which sort of intersects with uh, the, the, the uh, organ theft urban legends I'll be talking about today. Um, I was, when I was putting together the, the, the talk here, I realized that, uh, that of course, this is, this is a broad audience, it's Dragon Con, people wander in from who knows where. In some cases, I really wonder where it came from. Um, and of course, not everybody here is folklore. So I want to begin with a little bit of sort of overview uh, about about folklore and, and urban legends, and zoom in on one of the one of the urban legends that really drew me to the to the topic of investigation, which is the the organ theft legends. So, um, a lot of people when they ask what I do, I first of all I try to gauge like what sort of answer are they wanting. Are they wanting like a weird answer? Are they like, oh I can I'm an author, I'm a ghost investigator, chupacabra expert, urban legends, take your pick. And oftentimes if I say folklore, they're like, oh. What is that? <laughs> like folklore, that's like, like fairy tales, right? Yes, folklore is fairy tales. It's also food ways, it's also recipes, uh, it's, it's urban legends, it's other types of legends, it's myths, um, it's conspiracy theories. Um, that's one of the things I love about folklore is it has all these intersections with critical thinking and that. So uh, I'm gonna zoom in on, on urban legends. So before I jump into it, um, can people, can, can this audience, because you all seem pretty bright, uh, at least judging by the costumes, um, can you, uh, anybody, t tell, me, tell me a characteristic of urban legends. What is an urban legend? Just shout it out. Friend of a friend. Friend of a friend, tales. yes. What else? Warnings. Warnings, okay, good, yeah. What are, what are other characteristics like? If you hear the word urban legend, um, of course, you know, there's also the, the uh, horror film franchise. Um, but what, uh, what, what jumps out at you? What, what do you got? What do you think of when you hear urban legend? Cautionary tales. All right. Weird stuff. <laughs> the kind of story you want it to be true. Okay, you're in the wrong place for this because these are organ theft legends. <laughs> so, unless you desperately need an organ, and you might after last night. Um, uh, this is not the kind of story that you want to be true, but, you, but yes, you're right. That's not exactly what I meant. <laughs> you know what, whatever. Um, yeah, so no, so basically the, the, there's a couple different sort of aspects. The one, one aspect of urban legends is that they are told as true. That is, it's, it's like this isn't a joke, this really happened. Not, not to me, but to a friend of a friend, you know, my boyfriend's cousin's gardener's, you know, ex-wife's lawyer, had it happened to him or her, and so on. So these are stories that are told as true, and they're, they're set in the real world. That is, uh, there are not urban legends about space travel. There aren't urban legends about uh, dragons. Urban legends are, are set in the everyday life. They happen in, in, uh, uh, on lover's lanes, where there may or may not be a hook-handed killer. Uh, they're set uh, in, in shopping malls down the street from us, they're set in our backyard, and so on. So there are stories that circulate that, uh, again, they often do have a cautionary tale, which is one thing I heard earlier. And, and oftentimes there's, again, there, there's, a, there's a twist at the end, right? There's a reason why people share them. And this is, this is, this is key to understanding urban legends. It's not just a story, it's a scary story. Or it's a funny story. Or there's, there's some reason why you like the story enough to tell it to somebody else. And you may or may not have put yourself into the legend <laughs> in the process. 
So there's a couple aspects. Again, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here, but there's a couple aspects to that. Uh, another part of uh, another aspect of urban legends that's useful for this discussion is to know that they, uh, they tend to be localized. That is, uh, for example, one of the most common urban legends is the vanishing hitchhiker. Are you familiar, some of you familiar with that? I'm seeing some nods there. Okay. So I won't go into the whole story, but basically it's, it's this legend about this, uh, this figure oftentimes uh, seen on a lonely road. Sometimes it's a, a full moon night or a moonless night. Take your pick. Um, yeah, you see where this goes, right? Um, and uh, to, and a, a couple's driving by, and they see this poor figure by the side of the road, and they say, you know, can, can you help me out? Sure, no problem. It's cold. It's dark. You know, where are you going? Uh, and uh, oftentimes they'll say, well, I'm just live up the road. Uh, and they get in the back of the car, and they're driving, and it's strangely silent. They're not really saying much. Uh, and as they approach the, the, the house or the farm or whatever it is that was indicated, they vanish. I'm like, what? They're just in the back. I mean, the, you, you know, they didn't jump out, didn't stop, drop, and roll. The, you know, what, what the hell happened? And anyway, there's a whole story, and they, they pull over, and they knock on the door and say, oh, you must mean Susie. Su Susie died on this very night 25 years ago. And one of the in interesting parts about them is that, again, it's localized. So if you live in New Mexico, you will hear about that happening just down the road from me. If you live in Atlanta, you maybe hear it you know, over in, in, uh, in, in Kennesaw, uh, wherever it is. So the, the, the stories, they're not set in some far off place that isn't relevant to us. They're set in places that this could really happen because that makes it more immediate and that gets your attention, right? You don't give a shit if some weird thing is happening you know, in Paris you know, in 1937. You want to know, is this happening like last week down the road? <laughs> that's, that's really what we're interested in. So. With that somewhat a rambly preamble, uh, here is uh, the talk on urban legends. So, organ theft legends. I'm hearing giggling. You think, you think this is funny? Do I amuse you? <laughs> Angie loves this one. So she's like, can you do the legend talk? I'm like, oh, fine. So, um, there's actually a couple. Uh, so, anyway, I should back up a bit. So, uh, my interest, I, I've been long time been a skeptic. I've been with, with uh, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry for uh, over 25 years. I worked with the amazing Randy, Paul Kurtz, Joe Nickel, um, you know, some, some of the best of the best. Um, and I, didn't, I wasn't originally interested in urban legends. I was interested in investigations and weird things and mysteries and chupacabras and ghosts and evil clowns later on, as one does. Um, but the urban legends sort of came at me later, and that was because I was introduced to them by uh, Jan Brunvand, uh, who some of you may know. He's sort of considered the, 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 the grandfather or the godfather of urban legends. Uh, he's now retired. He lives in Utah, and he's written many books on urban legends, including The Choking Doberman uh, and others as well. And I met him at a conference, and it was like so cool because like, this is you know he was the guy that sort of collected these these sorts of scary stories and urban legends in the 70s and 80s, and he's just this unassuming you know retired professor who just was this wealth of information. Like this is so cool, and so I'm meeting with him and learning from him, and so the very the reason I'm bringing this up is that. Uh, the very first time that I wrote an article for Skeptical Inquirer magazine that was a full-fledged article was exactly on this topic. Uh, and I got uh, Jan Brunvand to write the introduction, for which I am still uh, delighted. So in, in, in the process of researching the topic, there are a couple things that jumped out at me about it. One of them, and, and this sort of circles back to the, the premise of urban legend in general, is that they tend to be... Um, uh, again, they're scary, they're funny, there's some reason why they're compelling and, and it's going to make people want to repeat the story. And oftentimes, as was mentioned earlier, there are warnings, right? There's a, tw there's, there's a twist, there's, there's something you take away from this. Uh, don't pick up hitchhikers, <laughs> might be one of them. Or beware of strange people or strangers. Uh, and uh, if, if any of you saw the, uh, the, the panel I was on yesterday, I, I briefly talked about this. But oftentimes, urban legends will um, have, uh, they'll have different functions depending on how they're used. But oftentimes, they'll have uh, really toxic themes. Uh, we see themes of xenophobia, uh, fear of foreigners, fear of the other, fear of, um, you know, who is doing this evil thing? Well, it's them. It's, it's the, the, the people, the, the they, the capital T, they. Who is they? Depends on who's, who's telling the legend. 
In this case, you can break the, the, the legend stories down into two distinct uh, aspects. One is the stolen kidney story, and the other one is the baby part story. So the stolen kidney story is probably the one that you all are most familiar with. Uh, it's the one that Angie uh, <laughs> touched on before. In a nutshell, um, the, the, the version, and again, there's different versions, different variants, but the, the basic story is that a businessman on a vacation meets a beautiful young woman at a hotel bar, maybe Dragon Con. Uh, they flirt and go back to his room for drinks. Sadly, this did not happen to me. Uh, the next thing he remembers is waking up in a bathtub full of ice and a note nearby saying uh, his kidneys had been moved and to call 911. Uh, cue the dramatic music, the freaking out, this sort of thing. Um, and of course, as, as, a, as a skeptic investigator, you can already see some, like, really? This, I mean, okay? Did this really happen? I mean, waking up in a tub of ice, that right there is like, how long have you been in this tub of ice? <laughs> right? It's like, you didn't wake up before this? Like, where, where did this come up? Uh, here is a, here's a quick panel if you can read the whole thing, but basically it's, it's uh, called the, the Kidney Heist, and this is taken from uh, the big book of urban legends. Uh, I think uh, Brunvon edited it. Basically, uh, again, you may or may not be reading it on the screen, it, it it's, has these two surgeons that are sort of swapping stories over organs, uh, I think it was, uh, looks like two, uh, two coroners, and they're, they're telling a story to pass the time, as, as surgeons do. Uh, is that what you do, Angie? You, you, you swap urban legend stories while you're working on people? Yeah. Yes, that's, <laughs> look, keep, keep that in mind. Mal, malpractice. Um, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but the point is, so, so basically they relate this story, uh, and, and you know, the, this, this kid, basically the, the idea is that the, the, the body that's on the slab they're both working on is, is of course, missing a kidney, and they're discussing how, it, how exactly it is uh, that they... Um, uh, that, uh, that that this this uh, this patient came to them, uh, and the last line is it all happened uh, at uh, at Park General, again Park General, right? The the next hospital over, not not 50 years ago in Japan. This happened recently nearby, uh, and the guy says, "Cool, where do you want to eat?" So they all oh, let's talk about this gross stuff and then and then have a bite. So even though that's the classic example, there are many sorts of stories and with identical themes and slightly different details, what folklorists call variants. So, though, so again, there's different, depending on who's telling the story and, and their purpose in telling a story. Because keep in mind that, that one of the characteristics of folklore is that it serves a function. There, there's a reason people love these stories, tell these stories, and pass them on. And part of it is because they want others to, uh, to, to do something. Either work, either behave one way or, or behave a different way. Uh, I have a podcast called Squaring the Strange, and uh, a couple years back we did a show on on um, on boogie men, boogie women, uh, and the the function that that uh, folkloric figures such as boogie men play in in, uh, uh, in 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 social control. So again, there's there's that that's one of the key themes here is that. Is that you know? As I said, you'll, you'll hear different versions in different places, and sometimes different parts of the story will, will be differently emphasized depending on what what message they're trying to get across. So I want to sort of hit on some of the the, the pop culture aspects because you know this is Dragon Con. So probably the the most famous uh, organ theft story uh, is Coma from 1978, um, and that was based I think on Michael Crichton, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and um, again, one of the most first and widely seen uh, books depicting organ theft uh, had, um, uh, I'm trying to read, who's in there? Uh, it was actually Michael Douglas, one of my favorite actors. So that, again, this is, and I remember seeing this uh, in 78. I, I don't know what it was rated. I probably shouldn't have seen it. Um, but anyway, I was like, oh, this is, you know, our, this, and, and this happens, um, or so they say. Uh, there, again, that's sort of the, the main one that, that would be familiar to American audiences, but there are others as well. Uh, the, uh, the 1998 film Grand, uh, Central Station, which uh, won a Golden Globe, it was, uh, it's from Brazil, uh, and uh, it's in Portuguese, and I've seen it. It's interesting, and again, this is, this is a fairly recent one. Uh, and then there's also Harvest, uh, Miguel Ferrer, Ferrer uh, and uh, I'm trying to read the, the bottom line there. It's uh, this sort of, I can't read, it's too fuzzy, but again, you, you sort of have this, the, these doctors, this sort of medical setting, and then the harvest, 
what are they harvesting? Is it organs or is it corn? <laughs> it's organs. Um, more recently, of course, we have teristas. Uh, and, uh, and then the follow-up, of course, uh, teristas. Uh, I think there's a part two, because of course there is. Uh, and of course, you know, in, in the case of teristas, now, so in the case, so I want, want to point something out here. So Central Station, as I mentioned, uh, is a Brazilian film. And Teristas uh, is, of course, uh, uh, well, here's the, the tagline is, uh, there are some places tourists should never go. And, of course, we have uh, some attractive young Americans uh, who are partying too hard in Brazil, and bad things happen to them. So, again, clean-cut, wholesome uh, kids are just out there having fun. They go to Brazil, and, oh, my God, what do Brazilians want to do? Besides, you know, deplete the Amazon, they want to take your kidneys. It just, it's just a known fact. So, so again, these are some of the, some of the things that come up here. So that that sort of is is a, an overview of the the adult uh, organ theft. So then I want to I want to touch on on uh, on the baby part story, and because uh, this is sort of the, the second darker side. This is the, the the version of the urban legends that doesn't get as much attention. And understandably so, when you sort of see how it fits in the in the in the in the, uh, in the context of things. Uh, but it, it is a lesser known and, and somewhat more dangerous side. Um, so just to circle back for a second to the uh, the uh, the, uh, the, the, the Central Station film in Brazil, uh, Nancy Shepherd Hughes uh, describes rumors and urban legends uh, throughout Brazil of quote the abduction and mutilation of young and healthy shanty town children, the favelas. Uh, outside of uh, Rio de Janeiro, especially in Sao Paulo, who are eyed greedily for their body parts, especially eyes, heart, lungs, and liver. These children would be nabbed and shoved into the trunks of vans. Some were murdered and mutilated for their organs, and their discarded bodies were found by the side of the road or were tossed outside the walls of municipal cemeteries. Now, uh, Shepard Hughes is an anthropologist. She's, she does some folklore as well, but she's, she's describing... Uh, the, the, the rumors that, that did and do circulate in Brazil and the consequences of them. So again, it's, it's one thing, oh, this is a you know, scary Hollywood horror film. Yes, and it's also something that, that scares many people, particularly in, 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 in third world countries such as Brazil and the Philippines and Africa and elsewhere, into avoiding medical help. And this is, this is an issue that I'll talk about later. So Vernique Campion Vincent notes that in some versions of the story, the scenario is of pseudo-adoptions, uh, in which children left poor countries only to die upon operating tables, not to be welcomed into loving families. It is commonly referred to as the baby part story, since organs taken from these children are allegedly used as spare parts in transplants. Someone finds that funny. <laughs> I know, I know. So, uh, so here's sort of a breakdown of, of the different types of the legends, uh, just sort of in a simplified version. So in the adult legend, it's basically a, a morality tale about promiscuity, right? I mean, that's, this, is, this is who this is being warned about, right? If you're, if you're, uh, if you're a traveling salesman and you're you know, a, a drug sales rep and you're you know, out of town and there's a cute woman, you know, don't flirt with the cute woman because, yeah. You're going to lose some organs. Uh, the adult legend usually happens in the United States. Oftentimes, the story of the adult legend occurs in, New, in Las Vegas, New Orleans, Atlanta, places where you know, there's lots of conferences going on and, and bad things are going on, again, typically in the US. Uh, the adult legend is told as more of a, a, a narrative legend or a, or a story, right? So it, it's, it's folklore and legend insofar as there's a beginning, middle, and an end. We, we follow the arc of the story. This is the setup. This is the climax. This is what happens. Oh my god, this is scary. In the adult legend case, uh, note that the victim is alive. right? The, and oftentimes, it's, it's told from the victim's point of view. Because you know, I woke up in a bathtub full of ice, and I saw this thing to call 911, that sort of thing. So the victim is left alive if you know without one organ. And the victim, uh, and this goes back to the first part, is usually male. In, in some cases, it's a woman, but in most cases, it, it's, it's a man, again, sort of circling back to the, the morality tale about promiscuity and attractive women in bars. 
in the, uh, in the child legend case, we have some different versions, right? So here we have a much, much more evident uh, xenophobic stranger danger theme, right? It's, it's, uh, it's not that you're putting yourself at risk by flirting with, with mysterious women in bars, it's that your children are in danger. Your children might be abducted for their organs. There are stranger danger, evil cults, QAnons, uh, take your pick, that are out there circulating around uh, trying to abduct children uh, and, and use them for their organs. And I could go on, I mean, we don't have time. I could, on, on, on the show Scoring the Strange, we've done lots of stuff on this. Uh, and, and particularly, uh, we did stuff, for example, on, on, uh, on uh, TikTok panics and stories. Some of you remember, uh, may remember a couple years back, there were rumors about, uh, about um, kidnapping rings at Target. You guys remember that? Yeah, so this and Wayfair, uh, and also, and I, I got so a, a reporter with Rolling Stone magazine, E.J. Dixon, got me in her Rolodex, and so she she called me up for I think five or six of the stories, quoting me because she wanted a folkloric context, and I'm glad she did because what I was able to do was to sort of put these stories in context, and it, it's it's uh, somebody I forgot who it was, but somebody the other day was talking about the importance of putting uh, putting uh, folklorists in the media, I think it could have been Celestia or somebody else, where, where it's important because oftentimes folklorists, they, they slash we, we see these narratives all the time. This is what we do. The, uh, we, we, we see the patterns, we, see the, we, we know how these stories have changed over time. Whereas to a lot of the public, this is a new scary ass story, oh my God. And or same thing, another example would be the, the Halloween sadists where every Halloween there's these rumors going around that there's trick-or-treaters that are finding razor blades and apples, how they get them in there, I don't know, uh, or tainted candy or wherever else. Uh, and, and again, they're, the journalists are so focused on making a scary, dramatic, sensationalized story, they, they don't recognize or forget, to, they just don't realize that this is an urban legend. Who knows about urban legends? Folklorists, talk to them. We can explain the sorts of things, but oftentimes they're, of course, too busy freaking out about that. Uh, so, and again, we see this with child legend. Uh, typically, um, and again, sort of following up with the the the, the context, usually uh, it happens in Latin America, particularly uh, Mexico and Guatemala and Brazil. Uh, so, oftentimes, Latin American countries, uh, and it's, and interestingly, it's, it's not. It, it's usually, but not always, Americans who are doing it. So the parts of the legend are that, again, the organs go somewhere. Well, who's taking the organs? Westerners, Americans, sometimes French, Brits, right? These, these baby organs are not going off to India. They're not going off to the Philippines. They're not going off to Nigeria. These org there's a trade in, in organs, according to the story, going to uh, the, the one percenters, uh, the, the, the Americans and so on. Uh, and, and again, the, the legend, the child legend is presented as a known fact. Like, yeah, this, this happens. Like, didn't you know that? This, is, this was on TV. I saw it in Law and Order. It's documentary. It's great. Uh, so again, this is, instead of the, the, the legend per se, again, having a whole narrative, it's like, this, this happens. It's, it's unfortunate. It's terrifying. But this happens, and, and you go on. Of course, in the child legend case, the victim is dead because the organs were successfully taken, and it wasn't just a, a kidney. It's usually um, you know, a heart or a cord, anything like that. There are a couple cases in which there are children that were claimed to have lost organs, and I can I can talk about that later. But for the most part, the child is dead, and uh, compared with the adult legend in which the the uh, the the, uh, the protagonist of the story uh, is a male, usually the victim gender is irrelevant, because of course. It's organs. Boys' lungs, girls' lungs, boys' kidneys, girl kidney, uh, it doesn't matter. So that's sort of a breakdown of the two different parts of the stories. So it's scary because, of course it is, because it's, it's, a, it's a horrific claim. But is it true? Right? That's as, as, an, as, a, as a skeptic and, and an investigator, that's sort of ultimately my question. Um, you know, I, I mentioned briefly in another panel that, it, that I sort of wear two hats because as a folklorist, folklorists typically don't care whether it's true. It, it's not relevant. I, did it happen? Don't know, don't care. Uh, it's, you know, the, for the most part, the interest of folklorists is how did this legend 
get transferred? Who, who told it? How did they tell it? How can we date that? Did it appear in someone's journal or a book or whatever else? So as a folklorist, I'm much more interested in tracing out what parts of the story were dropped out by, by which people when they were telling it in what context and so on. That's all well and good, but as investigators, like, yeah, but is this true? Like, I, I mean, I, I get the folkloric side, but at the end of the day, it's like, I want to know, is, is this happening? Because that's important to know. So with all due respect to the folklorist side of, of what I do, uh, yeah, we, we, the, the truth matters. Uh, and if these things are really happening, then we need to put a stop to it. If they're not really happening, then we need to understand that and not, for example, devote resources to, to tracing down uh, phantom fears. So, uh, you know, while newspapers and magazines um, uh, profit from s sensational headlines about vamp vampiric organ thieves, the truth is there's no evidence to suggest that these organ theft rings actually exist. Uh, there's a couple nuances to that, but a a in a nutshell, that's, that's the answer. Um, part of the reason, and again, I'll go into um, some others as well, is that it's virtually impossible to remove a usable organ from an uncooperative patient and place them in a recipient. Uh, I'm not a medical doctor. Uh, there are medical doctors in the room. You can ask them later, but I got a pretty good sense about this. Um, it's not as, it, it, it doesn't work like in the movies. There's, there's, lots of, there's lots of things that are gone. You have to, uh, there's, you need sophisticated medical equipment. You need histocompatibility tests, uh, of the same blood type. Um, if you're gonna take, I can't just take a random organ from one of you and put it in somebody else because depending on your blood type, depending, depending on sorts of things, antigens, it could be rejected. And then, every, then you're worse off than, that ever, than before. So there's lots that has to go into actual uh, actual safe um, uh, medical um, uh, uh, um, transplants. Uh, the donors and recipients have to be matched. Uh, you need to do these sorts of things in advance. Again, you can't just take out an organ. Then it's like, will this work? <laughs> no, this needs. You need preparation. This is not. This is not an afternoon thing. I would take between four and six hours and, and involve between ten and twenty support staff. And again, it, it's like it's like the conspiracy theories, right? It's like you would. In order for this to be true, you need more and more people involved. We're not just talking one evil surgeon, Dr. Giggles comes to mind, if anybody watched Dr. Giggles. Not a great film, but anyway. Uh, Larry Drake, I think. I'm a, wow, there, there's a pull. Um, there's, there, doc, there's only one, you know, there, there would need to be an infrastructure here. This is, not, this is not as easy as it sounds. And as a practical matter, uh, it would be impossible to, 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 uh, to assemble such a large team of highly trained medical staff willing to engage in this illegal practice. Now, there's lots of doctors that do illegal things, but you know, but keep in mind that there, there would have to be this, this infrastructure to make this whole thing work. And in many of these cases, uh, the, the doctors, they're already, they're, already, you know, they're, they're already making pretty good money for, for where they are. If they're Mexican doctors, Brazilian doctors, they're not gonna risk their livelihood to engage in this, in this other this other uh, stuff. So one of the interesting things to my mind is, you know, how, well, that's all well and good, but I mean, how do these stories circulate? How do they get started? And there's a couple different answers. One of them is that people interpret reality, uh, see people do TV shows as depicting real incidents, sort of the, the based on a true story effect. Uh, so people see things on TV, and they may, they may know it's not a documentary, but they're like, well, that, that really happens. I'll give you one quick example. I remember I was, I, I was coming out of a, an exorcist uh, screening years ago. It wasn't when it originally came out. It was, it was, it was much, much long after that. And I was following uh, two, uh, two young women, uh, probably in the late teens, and one said to the other, I was like, wow, that's, that's super crazy. It's like, you know, and that really happens, you know, the, the, the whole possession exorcism thing. And as it happens, I've, I've researched this, written about it. And what, what struck me was that we had both seen this film. We'd both seen the, 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 uh, the Exorcist by William Peter Blatty. William Friedkin, of course, recently died. And what, what struck me was that we had just both seen the, the entirety of this film. And we, we both saw all we were supposed to see, the themes, the special effects, this and that. And we left the theater with two very different interpretations. I left it saying, wow, that was kind of a scary movie. Not his best. Check out Sorcerer if you want to see William Friedkin's best film. 
Uh, but it's, you know, it's a reasonably good film, but it's, it's, it's a, you know, these are actors, these are scripts, this didn't really happen. Someone else coming out of there says, well, yeah, it's a script, these are actors, but, it's, it, but this happens. This is a dramatization of things that actually go on. So that struck me as like, you know, people can see the same thing and have wildly different interpretations of them. And this is the sort of what we see in the, in the organ theft stuff. There's also sensationalized, uh, poorly informed news reports. Um, and there's occasionally an influence of social justice activists, um, and I'll touch on that a little bit later, where people will, um, will try and sort of get on this bandwagon of you know, protecting children uh, from organ theft and against child trafficking. That's good to some extent, unless you're suddenly jumping on this QAnon bandwagon thing where, well, of course there's all these rings and people are ducking these kids all the time, which is not only not true, but, but counterproductive. Uh, and then there's another element to it is xenophobic rumor and gossip, for example, the Jewish blood libel myths. So the, 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 uh, so in terms of the, the origin of these, uh, I, I talked about some of the, some of the uh, political reasons. So uh, in some cases, organ theft accusations have been leveled for, by, by, uh, for political reasons. Uh, Todd Leventhal of the US um, Information Agency, part of the State Department, noted in a report that during the Cold War, um, the KGB was actively circulating um, urban legends that, that Americans were behind this. And as, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, the Russian disinformation uh, campaign has ramped up significantly in the past five years or so. This is, a long, this, is, this is part of a long time pattern here. And we know for a fact that back in the 80s, part of the Russian strategy was to circulate anti-American legends saying that Americans were behind this and abducting kids. Uh, and in fact, in recent years, it's become fashionable in Russia to sensationalize crime stories, not just in Russia, of course, but to sort of, you know, to, to highlight the, the American involvement in it to, to sort of gin up anti-American sentiment. Another aspect is, in terms of the, the origins of these, is misunderstanding, uh, confusion with genuine, genuine actual sales. So, are there organ thefts? No. Are there organ sales? Yes. Uh, people do, people can and do sell their organs. Uh, people can and do donate their organs. That's not what we're talking about. The legend is theft. That is the theme here. That is, it's about agency, it's about consent. And this is an important nuance here because, again, there, there is an organ trade. And you can have whatever feelings you may about that in terms of whether it's ethical or not. It does happen. Um, but, but not organ theft. Another, another aspect is inter-country adoptions, and, and I sort of touched on this with, with uh, Russia as well. And there have been cases of very shady um, inter-country adoptions. In some cases, children have, have been sold by parents or others, especially from poor countries. But again, not, not for their organs, that's, that's, that's not a thing. As I touched on a second ago, in some cases, selling organs is perfectly legal. In India, for example, many adults voluntarily sell one of their kidneys. Um, it's not illegal there. Again, you can, you can have whatever qualms you want, and we can have a discussion about the ethics of that and whether it's ethical for a person from an impoverished situation or country to get money for their organs if that organ is going to a rich person in the same country or elsewhere. That's a legitimate discussion, but that's not what's going on here. There was a case of Ahmed Kok, which happened in 1989. Uh, there was a Turkish man who claimed that three months earlier, and again, you're going to see how the press plays a role here. Three months earlier, he had been brought to London with a promise of a job. When he went in for a medical check, he was given an injection, which he believed to be a blood test, but he woke up the next day to find that his kidney had been removed. Well, you can see how the British tabloids had a field day with this, right? Turkish man, we have a name, uh, we have a date, this is what happened. Uh, he's like, yeah, I came in London, uh, they told me they were going to give me some money. I woke up the next day, not in a bathtub full of ice, but they took my organs. Well, he lied. That was not true. Turns out, uh, upon some investigation, because as you can imagine, this, this was taken seriously. Like, what? This is what? Well, he lied. He was, in fact, one of tur four Turks who voluntarily sold his kidneys, their kidneys, in September of 89. He was unhappy with how much he got paid, and he said, give me more money or I'll go to the press with it. 
knowing, of course, full well that there would be, as there was, legitimate indignant outrage at this, this horrifying practice, which doesn't really happen. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the, uh, the organ theft uh, rumor uh, still circulates. Uh, in my home state of New Mexico, back in 2003, uh, I, I was, I remember seeing, that, well, I clicked it out, this is originally from there. Uh, and, uh, and I don't have time to get into it, basically, uh, and some of you may know this, but on the, on the border between uh, Mexico and the U.S., New, New Mexico and, 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 U, and New Mexico primarily, uh, there's a problem of uh, desaparecidos. Uh, many people have gone missing, oftentimes young women who are factory workers who will migrate across. And this has been known for, for many years, and there's lots of theories about it. Uh, ranging from, set, from trafficking and this and that and the other. But one that jumped out at me was uh, Mexico theory, dead women harvested. Uh, Juarez killers may have taken their organs. And even back in 2003, I'm like, I don't think that's a thing, actually. <laughs> um, hey, uh, Mark Stevenson of the AP. Um, so, but again, here it is. The front page of the local newspaper is, is promoting this, this, this harvesting story. So I want to move from, from sort of the, the more abstract to the more specific. And this is a case that I, I wrote about at the time, I think, for, for Discovery News. Um, and oftentimes in, in, uh, in, in what I do, it's interesting because, again, as, as a folklorist, I will recognize these stories as they're emerging. I'll see, you know, here's, a, here's what's clearly an urban legend. Here's, here's, and it's not being recognized as an urban legend. It's being, it's being thought of as a genuine, terrifying trend. And I and others, I mean, not just me, but in the, in the folklore community, we, we talk about this. We're like, did you hear about this? Like, yeah, this is, you know, we're like, yeah. The same story circulated in 1983, you know, in Paris. I mean, we're all talking about this. You guys don't see it because you're not in the folklore circles. But as folklorists, we're having these discussions in real time, talking about, well, here's this story, clearly bullshit. We don't say that, but it's, it's clearly, clearly legend, and, and so we're talking about this. But, you know, it's not our job to contact the AP and CNN to explain this to them. I mean, if they contact us, we're happy to. But this is, one other, this is another case where in real time we see this, we see this going and recognizing it. Another example uh, is uh, the Blue Whale Game, which I touched, about on, uh, I touched uh, on a previous panel, uh, and we did an episode of Scoring the Strange on, on the podcast. Uh, and it's this, this, uh, this basically moral panic that circulated about five years ago of uh, all these kids today who are, who are playing these uh, Blue Whale uh, challenges on, on, their, on their phones, and the idea is that there's some, some hidden secret terrifying stranger danger threat that's making these kids do more and more terrifying things, including homicide and suicide. And I'm seeing this, I'm like, well, yeah, that's an urban legend. But everyone, everyone's treating this as like it's not, and it's, it's weird, because I'm like, you know that's, <laughs> again, no one's asking me, and this is the case here. So, with that rambly preamble, uh, this is the case of Matthew and Grace Wong in, in 2013. An Asian couple from Los Angeles who adopted African children went on trial in, in Qatar in November 2013, just 10 years ago, we're not talking the 1500s, 10 years ago, accused of starving their daughter, Gloria, to death to sell her organs. So some of you smart people have already seen the problem with this. <laughs> I'm guessing the, 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 the journalist didn't, but you're smarter than that. According to the New York Times, uh, Cutter police investigators in the report of Gloria's death found the cir family circumstances to be highly suspicious and wrote that the girl had been emaciated. The defendants, they concluded in an investigation, quote, participated with others in child trafficking, most likely either to sell their organs or to conduct medical experiments on them. Yeah, so... Um, Couple things here, um, as you might imagine, uh, Grace Huang and her daughter are Asian, and they are African uh, children. I imagine there was some sort of racial aspect to it because you know, uh, this there's like, well, hold on here, why would they have adopted these African children? Clearly for their organs, or maybe they just wanted to adopt children. Uh, so there's that. Um, and again, this made national news at the time. This is a you know. Front page story, CNN, uh, 2013. 
and, and as you can, as I don't need to tell you, because you're smart, uh, the charges were ridiculous. By starving their daughter to death, they would be damaging the very organs they're supposedly trying to harvest. If you want healthy organs, you don't starve the donor. That's the, that's the thing you don't do. I mean, I, come on, right? Um, starvation can lead to failure of the kidneys, liver, lungs, heart, and other vital organs. Uh, that's, that doesn't make any sense. That's not logical. There's, there's no basis to that whatsoever. Um, and if someone truly did want to take the kid's organs, her death would have been quick and, quick and done under medical supervision so the organs could be taken immediately. There's no, there's no use to a, 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 a dead, emaciated girl. That, that's, it's not a thing. And yet, it was being treated seriously. Um, in late two, here's another case. In late 2000, there was a horrifying news story came out of Russia. A grandmother was arrested for trying to sell uh, her five-year-old grandson, Andre. Now, again, there's... So, do parents sometimes sell their children? Yes. That, that is a thing that unfortunately happens. Are they trying to sell them for their organ parts? No, not a thing that happens. So let's just make sure that distinction is made. Police said the, the grandmother told the boy he was going to Disneyland. With the help of the boy's uncle, little Andre was handed over to a man in exchange for $90,000. But the story is more than just a tragic tale of child sold into slavery because uh, he was allegedly sold to a man who would take him to the West, meaning here, where his kidneys and other organs would be sold. Uh, and here, here, here's the report of the, uh, the, the case on CNN. Uh, Russian grandmother wants to sell child for organs. So again, if you're the average viewer of CNN, uh, this is why you might think this happens. Because CNN is reporting, it's there in the headline, this is taken seriously, this, this happens. Russian grandmother, now yeah, there's a scare quote in there, but come on. Um, so I dug into it. And uh, I was like, well, you know, I, I don't, again, uh, Mr., I don't think that's... Uh, so, he, so I dug into it, and in fact, um, the, the, what, what, what almost certainly happened was that uh, the, the grandmother sold the child in an illegal but uh, common adoption scam. Uh, I interviewed uh, uh, Shepard Hughes, who said, my understanding is the grandmother was willing to hand over her grandchild for a cash payment, but was not a paid international, it was not a paid adoption deal, but not for, for, not for organs. Uh, and sort of that, that layer was, was sort of added on to it. I actually contacted the CNN guy that wrote that in the Moscow Bureau. I was like, hey, I read your, read your article on CNN. I don't think he got that story right. He never got back to me. <laughs> uh, weird. Um, anyway, uh, so just to move on. So uh, sort of wrapping up here in sort of the, the, the overview here. So unlike freaky or funny urban legends about vanishing hitchhikers, microwave poodles, and giant alligators living in sewers, rumors and urban legends about organ theft have very real and serious consequences, including death. Just as an aside, when I was writing for Discovery News, I would offer try I, I would try to put put out skeptical content as science, because basically it often is. It's sort of the same thing. And one of my specialties, one of the reasons my editors liked me was because I could sort of put these, these claims in context. Like, okay, well, this is a legend, this is that, this is that. And there was one, so for the most part, the editors left me alone. They're like, Ben, you do great work, that's fine, we love it, it's weird shit, go for it. Um, the one story they rejected in my five years of writing for Discovery News, and I can't blame them, was I wrote a case where this really happened, where a, uh, a, a, a grandmother microwaved her poodle. It, it, it happened. It's not an urban legend, and I can talk about that later. But Matter's like, yeah, we're not going to go this one, Ben. <laughs> can, you, can you write about, like, you know, plants or something? This is kind of creepy. All right, fine. Uh, but the point here is that, again, some, and going back to the nature of urban legends, some are funny, some are curious, some are revenge stories, and some, of course, have real consequences. So what are the consequences and the dangers of, of organ theft legends? Well, I touched on a few earlier. One of them is decreased organ donation, particularly in, in, in South America uh, and particularly in Brazil. Um, keep in mind, again, this is, this is taken seriously. Not, not everybody believes it, but 
a lot of people do, and, and for, for good reason. Marginalized people have been badly treated by medical authorities around the world. This is well documented. But if you're, if you're living in, in a country, in a place where, where you're, you're that suspicious of medical treatment, you're that suspicious of doctors, you're not going to go to the doctors. You're, you're going to be like, I'm not, no. I'm, I, yeah, I, I, I have this pain in my chest. I'm not going to the hospital. They may take my organs. And this is this is not a joke. This peop, this this is this is you know this is this is one of the things that that, that uh, public health people have to deal with, is trying to circulate and and, and work around those. Um, and it it just it just and there's different ways to to try and combat that. And you know there's information campaigns, but you know to, it's, it's, to the extent that we saw this anti-vaccination barrage over the past few years about COVID, just amplify that by generations in other countries, and in terms of what, why don't people, even if they have access to, to doctors, they don't want to go. They're afraid that something, they're, they're going to take their organs, this and that, and is due partly to these. Another example, uh, what happened in, uh, in rural Guatemala uh, in, in, uh, in May 2000, was a Japanese tourist and Guatemalan bus driver were stoned and beaten to death. One of them uh, had his body set on fire, after accusations that the group were looking for children to abduct for their organs. Again, not that long ago in Guatemala, not too far away. There was another case, I, I actually wrote this piece now that I, now that I look at it on the byline, uh, in May 2014. Uh, there was another case where uh, there was a Facebook post, and again, social media plays a role in this. They, there's, you know, if you're looking at how do these rumors circulate, social media is, is of course, a, a prime mover of this. Uh, in Sao Paulo, there's a woman who was beaten to death by a mob who accused her of seeking children to abduct and take their organs for black magic. This also happens in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, uh, in, in Nigeria and Malawi and, and South Africa and elsewhere. Um, so again, there's, there's lots of other cases. This is, it's easy to sort of think, oh, this is silly, this is just a horror film, this happened. No, there, there are people right now, I promise you, in other countries, in, maybe in this country, that are being genuinely frightened by this and it's causing real harm. In, in April 2019, uh, rumors circulated on Facebook and WhatsApp that gangs of organ thieves were hunting for children. Uh, innocent bystanders were uh, attacked and cars uh, were attacked. So this is what happened, in case you're wondering what happened to, uh, to the Huangs. They were found guilty. They were found guilty of trying to starve their daughter to death to harvest her organs. Yeah, that's the update. Um, yeah, American, American citizens. Uh, so um, uh, it, it, later on, I mean, again, this is, this is 2014. Uh, Last I heard, I last time I looked up on it, it was again they didn't rescind the. I think basically they just they were released after a couple of years and they came to the states and they're laying low. But yeah, a a court of law and I use the word very loosely in Qatar decided this was a reasonable argument, despite it being obviously stupid, uh, in in unethical unfair. That um, yeah, this actually happens and they um, yeah so. Again, that's the, I, want to lead, I want to end with that because, again, I want to impress upon you all that as much as we, we talk about urban legends and stories and these sorts of things and rumors, they can and do have real consequences. They can hurt people. Uh, so please, please be careful what you share because this, you, may, you may think it's a joke, you may think it's funny, and sometimes it is, but depending on what you're sharing, People can be harmed by it. Uh, more information, you can check out a couple of my books, uh, Meeting the Makers, uh, The Martians Have Landed. Uh, I also have a book, uh, my most recent book is America the Fearful, uh, which I think came out f uh, six months ago. Um, I'm told it's good. Um, here's more information on uh, uh, Jan Bruinvand uh, and some of the resources on urban legends specifically. So with that, I appear to have 10 minutes in which I will take comments and criticisms in that order. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. We have a microphone out here in the middle. Please don't touch it. It will come to you. Any questions? Surely someone's got So questions. I promise you, I'm not really that ghoulish. I mean, I'm pretty ghoulish, but I'm not that ghoulish. 
<laughs> so I don't think it's funny. It's just so ridiculous. I know. It's I just teasing. not even wrong. It's so bad. yeah, yeah. It's, it's just like it's like it's like yeah. It's not it's not even wrong. It's like that's not the framework is not even. Act, it's like, you, yeah. how do you respond to that? It's so far outside of the realm of reality. So, oh, I see some oh, folks at the some mic. Mm -hmm. All right. Hello? Oh, hi. Yeah, I have a question. Um, yes. You know, well, you, you said something about the Wong's daughter, but what happened? Is she still alive? And why was she so amazing? No, 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 she died. Oh, she, she died. died. So, yeah. what happened with that? You know? Well, they, they, she died, and they assumed that it was because they were trying to starve her long enough to take her damaged but, organs. But did they ever find out what killed her? I mean, she was a young girl. Well, I, you know, that's what I'm curious about. Like, what's yeah, the girl? Well, yeah, I think I think she had a couple of health problems to begin with. I mean, I think it was a, a brother and a, and, a, and a sister. And as I recall, the the daughter had had you know health problems to begin with. Uh, oh. I forget where she was from. Oh, but yeah, okay. so they're yeah. Oh, so okay. basically, they, they were the the her poor health was being attributed to malice. Oh, okay. Uh, and, yeah. Okay. So that that was essentially All right, the well, problem. Well, that's what I was. Yeah, I was, that's why I was curious. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> okay. Hi there. Hi. I'm just curious, as a folklorist, would you say there's any link between the organ theft stories and the Jack the Ripper case? Hmm. Given what happened to the final two victims, one was missing a kidney, the other one was missing a heart. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that I would take a, a direct connection. I mean, you know, the, of course, the, the Jack the Ripper case is, is famous, you know, true crime, and this mm -hmm. and that, and lots of legends and stories and suspects and so on. Um, you know, I think that because the, the Ripper's, uh, you know, the, the Ripper's primary, I mean, the Ripper's known for killing, not harvesting organs. Right. So to, to, to that extent, I think that, and, and again, I'm not a Ripperologist, but I think that my guess is that because the, set, the stage was already set for this being a serial killer, gruesome, this and that, that the, the, the lack of organs found at the scene wasn't necessarily something that was going to be indicative that, the, that something had been done with those organs. But as, as an outgrowth of a cautionary tale, someone could have reached back and said, oh, I can base this on that, yeah. and people will put two and two together. Yeah, yeah, and of course, it's easy to do that, right? I mean, if you're a writer, if you're trying to make up a story, you're trying to sensationalize something, it's easy to sort of cherry pick and say, well, you know, this and that, and then connect those dots. Mm -hmm. uh, as a folklorist, I, I would say that's tenuous, okay. but certainly, you know, if I was writing creative fiction, like, yeah, let's, 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 let's lump them all together. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Um, what have you learned about um, actual organ sales in your research? Have you learned about like the dark net or like a black market selling organs? Yeah, to some extent. I mean, I, of course, I focused I focused on the legends themselves. Okay. So yeah. So I mean, for example, organ transplant. I mean, I, I got into organ transplants, organ sales, insofar as it fit into the the, the existing legends, right? And so. So you know, at at that at the point in which we're talking about the organ trade, again, that's 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 part of the story, but it's sort of it's ancillary because okay. that you know the, the 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 legend in both cases, the child and the adult, is non consensual agency being taken away, organs being stolen, being taken right, that, right. and at the point in which you are engaging in a in a transaction mm -hmm. uh, for money for take your pick at the point in which it's consensual that that's no longer part of the so so I so I, I did dig into some of that um, and again I, I mentioned Nancy Shepard Hughes and she's written quite a bit uh, about you know again the ethics of that right you, have, you know is it ethical to have an organ trade from poor countries to rich countries mm -hmm. and there you can see both sides on one hand you can say well um, you know my body my choice I it's my organs. I'll do whatever the hell I want to do with it. And if I want to sell it to somebody who's going to give me, you know, $10,000 for a kidney, then who are you to tell me otherwise? Uh, you can also say, well, that's all well and good, but, you know, is it, is it fair to have these, you know, these richer people? In some cases, it's not just Americans. I mean, usually the Americans are the target of the legends, but it could be rich Germans, it could be rich Indians, it could be basically anybody with resources. And, of course, resources, resources always, are, always go uphill, right? The resources go to the, those who can, who can pay for it. Right, but you have confirmed, like, in your research, you have seen those things are actually occurring? The, like the consensual yeah, yes, selling. Yeah, 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 absolutely, sure. Yeah, okay. yeah. It, it, it's not in in some in some. There's there, there's sort of a gray market, right? Where they're where they don't like to talk about it because okay. it's because nobody involved. Look, if you're 
in the organ trade, yeah. nobody benefits from shining light on it, right? Because everybody looks bad. Because if you're selling an organ, well, how could you do that? If you're buying an organ, how could you do that? So, so yes, it, 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 it has been confirmed. It does happen. Okay. People don't like to talk about it, not because it's illegal, but because it's kind of shady. It doesn't look good. Right? Yeah, it doesn't look good on any end of it. So, okay. Yeah. I just wanted to know what you found about that. Yeah, that's that's basically it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Hi there. So I was just wondering, what are like the more common organs that you've seen being like stolen or the least common? Well, uh, typically, uh, typically it's it's uh, it's kidneys. Uh, there's also corneas. Uh, so kidneys and corneas are the main ones. Now, keep in mind that, that not every, not all organs are equally harvestable or, or you know, trans, uh, you know, uh, harvestable, transmissible. What more what, what looking for? Transplantable. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I mean, you know, the, the main ones are are, are uh, kidneys, um, kidneys, sometimes lungs and corneas. At the point where you're getting to hearts, that's a lot more complicated. That's that's, yeah, you you're not going to wake up with that heart. <laughs> Unless you're the Tin Man, that would be weird. Um, but yeah, so so th those are the main ones. Now there was a case uh, where um, there was a kid in Brazil who claimed, and again, this is this is where the the confusion comes in. The, the guy, the, the kid claimed that he, his his corneas had been taken from him, and sure enough, he didn't have corneas. And it's like, oh shit, this this really happened. This this kid says this happened to him. He clearly doesn't have corneas. There is something going on here. Yeah. Well, they later discovered upon investigation that he'd actually lost his corneas to, to eye disease. Uh, he'd made up the story for he wanted attention, he wanted some money from journalists. He was he was telling a story. So the kid, again, he told this fantastic story, not fantastic in a good sense, but this <laughs> dramatic, sensational story. I mean, creative story. But yeah, very creative story. And again, true. and 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 like on its face, it's like. This kid says he is organ, his, his corneas swollen. He doesn't have corneas. Why would he make this up? Well, they go back to the records. Well, he, he lost corneas uh, several years earlier due to eye disease, um, and he wanted to be on TV and tell a story. And, but again, and th this reinforces to other Brazilians, this really happened. Did you see the, the kid on TV? Right? And they don't hear the more sober, skeptical follow-up. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Hi there. Think that the uh, urban legends about uh, the child stealing body parts contributed to the QAnon being able to sell the adrenochrome. Yes, yes, that is. You can make a direct connection there, and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, yeah. So again, without too, going too deep into that 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 cesspool. Um, yeah. So you know, it's, you know, any. I mean. I mean, there's, there's broader themes of, you know, danger to the children and rumors and, oh, my God, everybody should be afraid of your children, uh, you know, be scared for your children. Uh, and, and, you know, you had the abduction rumors, the, the TikTok rumors. There's people who claim that zip ties, if you find a zip tie in your car, uh, maybe you've seen TikToks about this. Like, this is a sign there's rumors, there's organ thieves or kidney kidnapping thieves. Uh, but, yeah, so, the, so at that point you have this, this, this idea of this extraction, Extraction of a genochrome, extraction of whatever it is. In some cases, blood. I mean, in in my in my book, um, uh, which book? Anyway, one in one of my books, I talk about oh the the chupacabra, tracking the chupacabra. I talk about section on vampires, and this notion of of blood being taken from in some cases children. And so you sort of have this whole vampiric story coming in. What? Uh, hello. Uh, I was wondering what effect on. Uh, urban legends, real uh, organ thefts, like what the impact um, on the legends that real organ thefts uh, have had. So organ thefts such as um, like the uh, governmental um, sterilization, like secret sterilizations of like uh, minorities or like uh, well, disabled. the sterilizations weren't organ thefts though. I mean, they they weren't they weren't be they weren't organs that were being taken from. They weren't viable organs take, being taken for somebody to. I mean, again, there, the, the background here is that there were absolutely lots and lots of unethical conduct across the board. Mm -hmm. But the legend specifically is about organs being taken for commercial use in, and put into, uh, into others. Do you want? Hi. Hello. So, no, that, you know, there were some, some uh, concerns because that happened in Georgia uh, with immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the women uh, had been. 
sterilized, and they, they claim they didn't know um, that they had been sterilized. They didn't know why they were going. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, yeah, I didn't mean to really weigh in. I just came no, up to say fine. we got like 12 seconds left. So um, uh, so if you have any other questions, Ben will, I'm sure, be happy yes. to answer them out by the our table. With, that's I look like skeptic. this. I'll be in the back. Uh, well, we're going to have you go to the table over there at the um, over by the escalators out You front. just tell me where to go. I, I'm your uh, no problem with that. So thank you so much for joining us on the Skeptic Track. We have ha are having a wonderful time. Please come back and join us later. Bye.